Charles Darwin compared the history of life on Earth to a great branching tree. The base of the tree represented the very first living cell, and the branches were new and more complex life forms that had evolved over time from the first primitive organism. Darwin was trying to explain how the branches on the tree of life originated. He was trying to show how natural selection could have modified existing organisms to produce the great diversity of plant and animal life that fills the earth today. But when it came to the base of the tree, which represented the origin of the first life, the first living cell, Darwin had very little to say. In fact, in the origin of species, he didn't even address the question of how life might have originated from non-living matter. The only glimpses we have of Darwin's opinions on the subject appear in a letter he wrote to a colleague named Joseph Hooker. Regarding the first production of a living organism, if, and oh what a big if, we could conceive in some warm little pond with all sorts of ammonia and phosphoric salts, light, heat, and electricity present, that a protein compound was chemically formed, ready to undergo still more complex changes, at the present, such matter would be instantly devoured. But this may not have been the case before living creatures were formed. During the final years of his life, Darwin did little to develop his idea that a primitive cell might have emerged from simple chemicals in the primordial waters of the early Earth. But later in the 1920s and 30s, a Russian scientist named Alexander Oparin formulated a detailed theory about how this could have happened. It was called chemical evolution. Oparin thought that he could explain the origin of the first life using Darwinian principles. He envisioned simple chemicals combining and recombining to form larger molecules, and then these larger molecules organizing themselves with the help of chance variations and natural selection into the first primitive living cell. Over the next three decades, Many scientists worked to develop and refine these ideas as they pondered the questions both Oparin and Darwin had raised. How could life have evolved from simple chemicals? One man thought he knew. The problem of biological origins has, for a very long time, I would say, has been a real deep interest to me just because of the scale of the problem, the importance of it. Uh, where did we come from? Uh, what are, why are we here? Uh, all that kind of uh, question. Uh, probed from the point of view of natural science. During the late 1960s and throughout the 70s and early 80s, Dean Kenyon was one of the leading chemical evolutionary theorists in the world. And like others in this field, he was trying to explain how life on Earth began through a purely natural process. In 1969, Kenyon co-authored an important book on the origin of life. Gary Steinman and myself thought that uh, if we were to pull together um, in uh, all of the uh, lines of empirical uh, evidence that had accumulated by the uh, mid to late uh, 60s in one continuous uh, argument, we were very enthusiastic about the possibilities uh, for explaining uh, the origin of the main life-building elements. Despite his optimism, Kenyon faced a significant problem. To explain how life began, he first had to account for the origin of the essential building blocks of every cell that has existed on Earth. Large, complex molecules called proteins. Proteins have a wide range of function in the cell, everything from structural requirements in terms of scaffolding of the cell, the cytoskeleton, to enzymes where they're actually processing molecules to harvest energy or to build components of the cell. Proteins do pretty much all of the jobs inside of the cell, except for storing genetic information. That's left to the DNA, the RNA. But all the day-to-day -day jobs, cleaning up the cell, making energy, it's all protein. Kenyon knew that proteins would have been as important to the first life as they are to living cells today. He also recognized the complexity of their construction. 
by the 1960s, scientists had determined that even simple cells are made of thousands of different types of proteins. And the function of these molecules derives from their highly complex three-dimensional shapes. The irregular shapes of some proteins allow them to catalyze or trigger chemical reactions because of the hand and glove fit that they have with other molecules in the cell. While other protein molecules form interlocking structural components. The individual parts of a bacterial motor, like this ring structure, are each made of either a single protein molecule or an assembly of proteins fitted together into a specific shape. These proteins are, in turn, made of smaller chemical units called amino acids that are linked together in long chains. There is a very great degree of intricacy of architecture down in the cell units in these protein-forming amino acids. In nature, 20 different types of amino acids are used to construct protein chains. Biologists have compared them to the 26 letters of the English alphabet. Alphabetic letters can be arranged in a huge number of possible combinations, and it's the sequential arrangement of the letters that determines whether you have meaningful words and sentences. If the letters are arranged correctly, you'll get meaningful text. But if they're not arranged correctly, you'll get gibberish. And the same principle applies for amino acids and proteins. There are at least 30,000 distinct types of proteins each made of a different combination of the same 20 amino acids. They are arranged, like letters, to form chains, often hundreds of units long. If the amino acids are sequenced correctly, then the chain will fold into a functioning protein. Proteins are arranged with their amino acids in such a way that the amino acids collapse on each other into an architecture that is pre-programmed by the order of the amino acids. It folds into a certain structure, and that structure can do a certain function. So all proteins in the cell have a certain three-dimensional pattern that's based on the arrangement of amino acids in the chain. This arrangement is critical. For if the amino acids are incorrectly sequenced, a useless chain forms and instead of folding into a protein, it will be destroyed in the cell. Proteins, like written languages or computer codes, have a high degree of specificity. The function of the whole depends upon the precise arrangement of the individual parts. But what produces the precise sequencing of amino acids that gives rise to the specific shapes and functions of proteins? During the 1950s and 60s, Discoveries about protein structure forced biologists to confront this mystery. Dean Kenyon believed he could solve it. In his book, Biochemical Predestination, Kenyon and his co-author, Gary Steinlin, proposed an intriguing theory. Kenyon wrote, Life might have been biochemically predestined by the properties of attraction that exist between its chemical parts, particularly between amino acids in proteins. At the time that biochemical predestination came out, I and my uh, co-author were totally convinced that we had the scientific explanation for origins. Kenyon proposed that the chemical properties of the amino acids caused them to be attracted to each other, forming the long chains that became the first proteins, the most important components in the living cell. And this meant that life was effectively inevitable, predestined by nothing more than chemistry. Many scientists embraced Kenyon's ideas, and over the next 20 years, biochemical predestination became a best-selling text on the theory of chemical evolution. Yet five years after the book's publication, Kenyon quietly began to doubt the plausibility of his own theory. It was during that whole period of time that my doubts about certain aspects of the evolutionary account became apparent when coming into contact with a powerful counter-argument given to me by one of my students, and I could not refute that counter-argument. Kenyon was challenged to explain how the first proteins could have been assembled without the help of genetic instructions. In living cells today, 
Chains of amino acids are not formed directly by forces of attraction between their parts, the scenario Kenyon envisioned on the early Earth. Instead, another large molecule within the cell stores instructions for sequencing the amino acids in proteins.